everybody and welcome back to another episode here of Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today we're going to be doing something we haven't done in a minute and that is an update on COVID-19, particularly a variant that people have started talking about called NB181. There's been some news headlines about this and growing numbers and all that stuff so we thought we'd dive into it for you today. Um, pull the curtain back so that we have a better understanding of it. Um, we will start with an overview of it. We'll talk about global spread and prevalence. We'll dive into key differences from previous variants, clinical presentation, symptoms, severity of illness, transmission dynamics, vaccine stuff, and public health considerations uh, to hopefully get us all up to speed on this. As a reminder, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. I should say none of these episodes because we have a podcast now as well. Uh, please stick around to the end of the, the episode for a, the full disclaimer. And then as a couple shameless plugs, uh, we have a podcast and a YouTube channel. Uh, we'd love for you to check those out, subscribe, follow along. We also have a Patreon page with both free membership and Patreon membership that we're pretty active on. And then we also have a weekly newsletter. So all that will be linked in the episode's description. And again, we'd love for you to have you. Uh, we'd love to have you. So check it out. No further ado, done with the shameless plugs. Let's talk about NB181. So what is NB181? Why are we talking about this? Well, NB181 was actually recently identified uh, as a variant of SARS-CoV-2. Obviously, SARS-CoV-2 being the viral name for the virus that causes COVID-19. And this variant, NB181, was classified as a variant under monitoring by the World Health Organization. It's a descendant of the Omicron lineage. Lots of the variants we've had over the last, gosh, year plus have been descendants of Omicron. Um, and if this is confusing, you know, there's the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus mutates, just like all viruses do, mutates over time. And those mutations start to lead to variants that are kind of further and further from the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. And these variants we give names to, but they keep mutating. So we give more and more names. So SARS-CoV-2 mutated, and at some point we decided to call one of like the kind of larger mutations Omicron. But then Omicron kept mutating as well. And now we have kind of Omicron lineage, lineage variants, one of which is NB181. Sorry, our allergies are getting us. But um, this particularly arose from a variant in the Omicron lineage known as XDV151. Not super important except for those of you uh, out there just like us who really nerd out on stuff. Uh, but yeah, that is the uh, recombinant variant uh, lineage that it came from. It was first detected actually in January of 2025. Um, so what is it now, June? About six-ish months ago, a little less than that. Uh, and since then, it spread to multiple countries, including China, which is a lot of where the press on it started, uh, Australia, and then the United States as well. And we'll get more into that. So speaking of which, when we talk about global spread and prevalence, we said that it was first kind of noticed in China and Hong Kong. First is relative, but it started to spread there. And it's actually become the dominant strain, the dominant variant in China. And there have been some reports of things like increased hospitalizations and emergency room visits. We'll get into if this variant seems to cause any more severe disease, but we also are seeing increased hospitalizations in China. We then found it in Australia, where it is currently causing about 40% of cases in Victoria, Australia, and about 50% of cases in Western Australia. So it's quickly becoming dominant in Australia as well. And it continued to spread towards the United States. We've now found it in several states, California, Ohio, Rhode Island, Hawaii, Washington and Virginia. Uh, and we've seen it in India too. So some very populous countries, cases have surged particularly in, we're going to totally butcher these names, Kerala and Maharashtra um, with this NB181 among circulating variants. So we've seen it in a bunch of high density countries, uh, including the United States. And it most likely will keep spreading and most likely will become dominant in some of these places while other variants emerge. So what are the key differences? What makes this variant different from previous ones? Why, you know, why are we talking about it? Why might it be becoming dominant? Well, it does have some genetic mutations that are important to note. And we wrote the, what the mutations are, but again, the, the detail of that is probably only interesting to some of the folks out there who are really kind of into this type of thing. But it has several mutations in the spike protein. And this fact is more important. So I'll talk about what the mutations are, then we'll talk about the spike protein. These mutations include T22N, F59S, G184S, A435S, V. 445H and T471I. Very interesting, right? So what is the spike protein for those of you that don't know? Many of you probably do, but the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a virus 
And like all viruses, it has these proteins on the outside of its viral shell. Uh, on the inside, it obviously has genetic material. And these proteins on the outside are called spike proteins or the S protein. And these spike proteins are what actually attach to the human cell to then allow the virus to infect the human cell. So any mutation in these spike proteins are always worth paying attention to because there's a chance that it would make the virus uh, kind of give it a stronger affinity to bind to human cell receptors and thus make it more infectious. All right, these mutations, as we just talked about, may enhance the virus's ability to bind to the human ACE2 receptor, which could increase its infectivity. And that's the human receptor that's primarily responsible for binding to the virus is this human ACE2 receptor. We've talked about a bunch of those things. We actually have a huge COVID playlist. We'll link it in the description. Um, it has a lot of videos from the past, uh, not a ton of videos from recent, but there are a couple in there, but check it out. We've talked about the ACE2 receptor and spike proteins and all that uh, a whole bunch of times. For any of the OGs out there who've been following the channel, even when it was called White board doctor, uh, give a shout out in the comments. Uh, we'd love to say hello. All right, other things. So we said that it has genetic mutations in the spike protein that could make it more readily uh, able to attach to the human ACE2 receptor and infect human cells. It also has some signs of immune evasion or, you know, escaping the human immune system. And particularly in laboratory studies, it looked like there was a 1.5 to 1.6 fold reduction in the ability of our antibodies to neutralize the virus. So our immune cells, particularly B cells, produce all these antibodies. And these antibodies are uh, molecules that are floating around and they're just looking for SARS-CoV-2 virus to attach to and neutralize, okay? Same thing with a bunch of other viruses. There's antibodies floating around our body to a whole, a whole slew of viruses. But it looks like some of the antibodies that we've produced to SARS-CoV-2 virus, our own bodies just from being exposed in the past, aren't as, as good at neutralizing the MB181 variant. Okay, so it suggests a modest decrease in vaccine-induced antibody effectiveness as well. So the vaccines still work against this variant, but there's a slight reduction in the efficacy of the vaccines against this variant. And then last is transmissibility. So we talked about the spike protein mutations. We talked about immune evasion. What about transmissibility? Well, NB181 seems to have a higher growth advantage over several of the co-circulating variants. Um, and this growth advantage then can lead to increased transmissibility between people. All right. What about clinical presentation, common symptoms? Well, most of the common symptoms are things we've seen from COVID in the past with one possible exception. And the common symptoms are things like fevers and chills, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, runny nose. I have one of those, but it's from allergies, fatigue, body aches, headache. Some GI system, symptoms like nausea and vomiting are these are, although these are less common. And then still, you know, those classic loss of taste and smell, which we saw much more kind of in the OG COVID variants. Um, but the thing that you might notice is all these are kind of generic symptoms of viruses. You know, these are symptoms you could ascribe to the flu virus or adenovirus or, you know, a whole bunch of upper respiratory viruses floating around out there. So none of this is kind of specific to COVID. Uh, now, it could be from COVID, but it could be from these other things, too. There has been one symptom that people have talked about, and frankly, I have no idea if this is actually true or not, but you do see it out there, so I just wanted to at least say it. Uh, people are saying that hoarseness, they're noticing more hoarseness with this variant NB181 compared to earlier strains, so a hoarse voice. You know, it seems maybe like a stretch uh, at the hospital. I certainly see patients with hoarse voices from all sorts of different viruses, but uh, people are talking about it, so I just wanted to throw it out there. There might be some correlation with hoarseness in this variant. All right, severity of illness, does it cause more severe illness? We said it might attach more strongly to the human ACE2 receptor, it might be more able to evade our immune system. Should we be worried? Are we gonna go back to a bunch of hospitalizations? Well, the good answer is probably not. Current data does not suggest that this virus, uh, this variant causes more severe illness than any previous variants out there. Hospitalizations have seemed to increase increase in areas where the variant is prevalent, but we tend to see that, right? Just when case counts increase, um, there tends to be more hospitalizations because we know 
People at higher risk can still get sick from COVID. Um, well, I see it in my day to day in the intensive care unit. It's not as common uh, and we don't see as many healthy people get as sick, but still elderly folks, folks with a lot of comorbidity still can get sick from COVID. So if cases go up because this NB181 uh, is causing more cases, you will see hospitalizations go up too, but it doesn't seem that this variant, at least per the data we have thus far, causes any more severe disease, which is a good thing. Okay, there's no significant uptick in ICU admissions or mortality rates that have been observed so far. As for transmission dynamics, uh, we talked about this a little bit already. This will not be any new stuff, but it does seem like there's some enhanced infectivity uh, by NB181 having more robust binding to that human ACE2 receptor, which may facilitate easier cell entry and increased transmission. And then the global spread mechanics here, we've seen this variant spreading in multiple countries with some degree of rapid increase in prevalence. Uh, and that does underscore that it probably does have this heightened transmissibility once we see variants start to kind of spread to multiple countries uh, and cause kind of rapid increases. So we most likely will see continued increase in cases of NB181, although again, reassured that it doesn't seem to cause more severe disease, although you still can get sick from it, right? You absolutely can, so you still gotta be careful, especially if you fall in a high-risk category. Vaccine effectiveness, uh, lots of discussion out there on uh, COVID vaccines, uh, COVID-19 vaccines right now. Uh, they are still expected to remain effective against NB181 in preventing severe disease and hospitalizations, although there is maybe some slight decrease in their efficacy based on lab studies. Um, but they still should prevent severe disease and hospitalizations as far as anyone is aware right now. All right, public health considerations. Uh, there is currently surveillance on this variant, so we should have some updated information as time goes on with how it is spreading. Um, normal preventative measures for those in high-risk groups uh, or if you're just worried about it, and vaccine campaigns. Again, you can still get sick from COVID. Uh, choose your own destiny, certainly, uh, but those at higher risk do have a risk. And if COVID cases are going up, it means more people will get sick from COVID just as a, a natural pace of case counts going up, just like if it was flu or anything else. So in summary, NB181 does seem to be rapidly spreading. It is an Omicron subvariant. It seems to have increased transmissibility and some modest immune evasion. Um, it does not appear to cause more severe illness, which is great. Um, but given its widespread presence, uh, stay vigilant. You know, watch yourself if you're in high risk group, uh, and we'll try to keep you all updated best we can. That's what we have for you today. Hopefully that was kind of a quick and dirty update on MB181, provided some more context information. Uh, I think you'll probably see some more headlines on this variant moving forward. And if something changes significantly, we'll certainly provide another update. But let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have. Certainly appreciate you checking out the episode. Check out that Patreon page, weekly newsletter, all that good stuff. That's actually the fastest way to get information from us because we tend to be able to post stuff on those in real time. Um, so if you're interested in kind of the most up-to-date stuff that we're doing, uh, definitely check those out. And uh, either way, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing. Hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high-yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial-free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on.